I conveniently used black font for my name under the dark settings, just in case this doesn't go well. You guys won't remember my name, but my name is Jeff McDonough. I'm Arcadis' uh, North American PFAS co-leader. Uh, I'm based in Portland, Maine, and I graduated from Penn State. And before I get started on the presentation, there were two things I wanted to cover. I didn't cover in my talk, but I feel are re relevant to, to point out to start this off. And the first is that, as you guys are probably well aware, PFAS has turned basically everything on its head. Analytical, fate and transport, remediation, source characterization, product stewardship, just about everything. It's found uh, we are on our heels catching almost daily. And when you start to think about the available strategies for dealing with it, either destroying it or trying to cut off suspected toxicological exposure routes, there are not any perfect options. There are a lot of options, but there are no perfect options. So I'm, I, I applaud uh, Setco and, and other uh, companies that are pioneering in product stewardship to try and develop new technologies to mitigate this problem and give us alternatives. Um, losing assimilative capacity of an aquifer is not a trivial thing. Trying to remediate something that's basically engineered to be indestructible is not an easy thing. So a lot of the strategies are more mitigation or management strategies. And when we talk about uh, in-situ stabilization, like Shadi did earlier, um, that is a management strategy specifically geared towards source zones. And that's what this case study is about. The other thing I wanted to hit is the analytical method. Um, Shadi had, had kind of spoke about the method 13, 13, 13, 14, 13, 15, 13, 16. Those are excellent leaching characteristic uh, assessments, but they're not the standard. There's a lot of experience in this room. When we want to look at leaching potential of soil, we look at synthetic leaching procedure or toxicity characteristic leaching procedure, SPLP and T-clip. We don't immediately jump to leaf assessment, right? That's a very aggressive and it's a very holistic look at trying to characterize in situ soil stabilization and its potential leachability. So that in and of itself speaks to the scrutiny that we're under and what we're up against from a treatment perspective. So with that, I'm gonna get started. And the first way that I wanted to start this presentation is to pull the uh, applicability of this technology into the source zone. So I'm gonna model in a uh, conceptual site model or a CSM of a typical fire training area or an FTA where aqueous film forming foam up here was applied. And these foams were applied uh, quarterly, maybe even bi-monthly for decades. And the quantities are, are staggering. We're talking about millions of gallons per training event of percent concentrations of foam. So it's not, a trivial, it's not a trivial amount that was deposited in the source zones over time. And when you have something that's non-destructive, you can have considerably robust source zones. And not surprising, some of the stuff that Jin talked about with poly and perfluoroalkyl acids, the precursor contents or the polyfluorinated contents of these aqueous film forming foams are proprietary. They were designed specifically to do what they do. And they're, they're diverse and there's a lot of them. Some, some estimates put them at about 5,000. And if they're cationic, if they're zwitterionic, and you have a high clay content, which is a negative surface charge, you're going to get electrostatic adsorption. It's going to stick around for quite some time. Even though you can get biological transformation of these polyfluoros into perfluoroalkyl acids, the terminal end products that have been referred to as forever chemicals that never degrade, if it's not in the liquid, if it's not accessible to the organisms to do it, they can't do it. So if it's stuck to the soil, this is why we still have PFAS plumes. And some of the data I'll show you is pretty staggering. Now, this is where the technology that I'm gonna talk about today is relevant. Schmier zone, light not aqueous phase liquid uh, co-released as part of the training areas. So we have significantly strongly reducing conditions in these source zones. That also retards the ability to biotransform precursors into perfluoroalkyl acids. So I understand that the regulations are dealing with PFOS and PFOA, but when we look at fluorosorb's ability to stabilize source zones, we need to consider precursors. And Jin did an excellent job incorporating that into her talk, and I've got some components of that into this case study. The other components of the fire training area that are somewhat irrelevant to this technology that I'm gonna talk about is the down gradient movement of the terminal end products, the perfluoroalkyl acids, ranging anywhere from C8 down to ultra shorts that are somewhat undetectable at, mo at, at current practice. There can also be anionic mobile precursors, so precursors that have the ability to transform into perfluoroalkyl acids, but because they're anionic, 
charge repels the clay surface charge, they will move down gradient and then subsequently transform down gradient under more aerobic conditions. So it's a very, very, very complicated CSM. I know everyone loves kaleidoscopes, so I made sure to use tons of colors, but primarily what we're gonna talk about here is this source zone that has what we'll classify as a robust amount of polyfluoroalkyl substances and other perfluoroalkyl acids. So what's the current solution for that? Dig it up and burn it. A lot of people are doing that when they have to. Most people have avoided source area treatment like the plague, not surprisingly. A lot of times these fire training areas are on the back 40. They're not being used anymore. They're abandoned. Um, if we are to do any sort of ex situ treatment, it could be on-site thermal treatment. It could be sending it to a landfill until the landfill says no way, which is happening in Michigan. Um, it, commercial incinerators can try to burn it. Uh, solids definitely burn easier than liquids, but there's <laughs> a good moisture content that has the potential to become airborne. So what in situ soil stabilization gives us, thank you Shadi for the very thorough assessment of the technology, I'm not gonna talk about it all that much, but what it does give us is an alternative to mitigate leaching from fire training areas. So what we need to focus on is the viability of the fixants, i.e. in this instance fluorosorb, to, present, to prevent that leaching to mitigate that leaching. So the three objectives of this case study, which was really an R&D project that went from the laboratory to the field, was to evaluate ISS to mitigate PFAS leaching from source areas, also evaluate viable fixants. We didn't just look at fluorosorb. I'm not gonna mention the products that we did look at, but I, they are listed here for comparison purposes. The third is to evaluate the analytical method. This gets to the method 1315 that Shadi was talking about and that I started with. Um, typically, T-clip is an acidic-based leaching technique. And under acidic conditions, you typically get positive surface charge. PFAS are typically anionic. You can get in, uh, promoted adsorption, right? So under acidic conditions, you get a false positive looking at acidic leaching conditions. So we wanted to make sure we were looking at circumneutral conditions, and we also wanted to make sure that we were looking at aggressive leaching conditions, not just a single 48-hour spin on a, on a bottle, but you know, nine sequential leeches over 63 days, as Shadi had, had spoke to. So the, the project staging, there was a pre-characterization stage, which I'm gonna talk through and show you how robust these source zones can be, then the treatability test in the lab, then the field implementation, and then the post-implementation monitoring. I like to toot my own horn and say that this is the first time that in-situ soil stabilization for PFAS has ever been implemented in the field. There's a lot of publications and literature talking about bottle studies, but this is the first of its kind of a field implementation perspective. The baseline characterization occurred in February of 2018, so relatively recently. Um, we collected 10 borings, uh, soil analytical and groundwater analytical. The soil samples, we had 10 samples each, so one sample per boring for grain size distribution, total organic carbon, target analyte list metals, and mercury. Uh, mercury was kind of fortuitous in that it fell under the TAL metals and was required in the regulatory framework that we're working in. Not really relevant for what we're looking at, but grain size, definitely applicable for in-situ mixing. Total organic carbon and TAL metals, definitely applicable from an adsorptive capacity of the PFAS. And then, we collected three PFAS samples per boring to try and give us somewhat of a higher resolution characterization of the source zone. Groundwater analytical, we did uh, 11, or 10, 10 samples, so one sample per boring. We did span the water level with this assessment. Um, water level was relatively shallow, around eight feet below ground surface. So we were able to get uh, aqueous samples pretty, uh, pretty quickly. And is anyone here familiar with the total oxidizable precursor assay? Heard about it? Okay, so some folks. Very quickly, the total oxidizable precursor assay is a chemical digest in a laboratory that force evolves all the polyfluoroalkyl substances into their terminal end products per fluoroalkyl acids. So when I say post-top data, I'm talking about the full payload of PFAS in a source zone. We'll make the assumption that all the laboratory QA, QC was appropriate, the digest worked, and all the polyfluoros were converted into pre to per. We also collected metals in TOC and groundwater to understand partitioning coefficients. <clears throat> so first thing I'm gonna present is the soil analytical data. Um, and the, the thing that I want you to walk away from with this slide is that this was a very mature source. This was a fire training area that had been not in use for almost a decade. So a lot of the uh, hydrocarbons that were co-deposited had kind of degraded away. 
We had slightly more oxidizing conditions than reducing conditions for typical fire training areas, and therefore we had quite a bit of precursor transformation into perfluoroalkyl acids. So precursor concentrations really weren't much of a, uh, a driver. The predominant precursor was the 8,2-fluorotelomer sulfonate at tens of parts per billion. That's not that robust for typical source zones. However, if you can see this concentration, and this is parts per billion with red being close to 10,000, so almost 10 parts per million, this is 9,000 parts per billion or nine parts per million in the soil in the source. They hadn't used this fire training area for 10 years. There's still 10 ppm in the soil of the C8 sulfonate PFAS. That is a robust ripe source zone, especially when you're trying to regulate down to parts per trillion concentrations. So we need something to deal with this. We need something to deal with source zone contamination at this high of concentrations. Um, very typical of the type of foam that was used. I'm not going to go into the forensics associated with that, but I'm sure there's people in here who will understand. Sulfonates outweighed carboxylic, carboxylics. Uh, the carboxylics that were present were primarily C6 to C8. And the TOC and iron were both indicative of significant adsorption potential for PFAS. Not surprising, there's 10 ppm in the source zone. Groundwater analytical data, um, somewhat similar. Uh, the post-top data confirmed in the, uh, from a QA, QC perspective, so there's a bunch of checks that go along with that. Um, negligible uh, perfluorosulfonic acids above C8. What that means is that PFOS, PFOS, the C8 sulfonate, was the primary uh, C, uh, perfluorosulfonic acid. Negligible carboxylics above C9. This is very characteristic of an old foam. Um, the short chains that were present primarily from likely uh, carboxylic precursors that had transformed over time. And about 5 ppm dissolved organic carbon. And if anyone knows anything about granular activated carbon treatment, 5 ppm dissolved TOC will ruin your carbon system. All right, switching more to the treatability testing. So we took that soil, took it into the lab. The objective was to optimize uh, the fixant dosing for the field, so not unlike a vial study ahead of a column test. We did some bench testing to pick what concentrations of fixant we were going to take to the field for the test pits. Uh, the reaction vessels were approximately 100 grams of soil, 200 grams of water. We tested four fixants, one of which was fluorosorb. Another was a proprietary product that is a combination of aluminum hydroxide and activated carbon. Uh, a layered double hydroxide, which is, never used the term in the definition, but it is a layer of hydroxides that is uh, designed to basically suck PFAS into the individual layers and supposedly, per the literature, perform very, very well for PFAS adsorption. And the last was a proprietary concrete sealant, which was a stretch. It was not intended for this purpose, but in the name of science. Um, three doses were tested per fixant, and we ran some controls, and all the work was done in our treatability lab in Durham with the analysis done commercially at uh, SGS Axis. This is a picture of what the shaker table looked like after we had combined the fixants, the soil, and the water and let them rolled for 48 hours. Uh, two buckets of soil were received. They were homogenized, air-dried. Um, we don't really worry much about volatilization of the perfluoroalkyl acids, so that's all good. The analytical soil samples that we collected in the samples after homogenizing were consistent with what we saw in the field, primarily PFAS dominated. And the geochemistry was also in good agreement from a QAQC check. So I'm going to present this data in two ways. First, on an arithmetic scale, because it looks much better. And then I'm going to present it on a log scale so we can get a better look at what it's actually, what, what some of these lower concentrations actually mean. And to set up this plot, uh, this is the liquid above the stabilized soil in those shaker bottles that had been centrifuged down. So it's the supernatant concentration. The control represents uh, no fixant amendment at all. The baseline is what we had in the field. And the first question might be, well, why is the control so much higher than what the baseline was? Shouldn't they be the same? The baseline was collected with a DBT point in the field, and we got a soil sample and sent it to the lab. The control data was soil that we pulled out of cores, homogenized, moved around, mixed up, got a much better, more representative sample of what was there. So it's not surprising that when you start to destroy the, access, destroy the architecture of the soil that you're sampling, you'll get more access to the contamination. That's why the concentrations are higher. 
Concentration on the, the, x -ax, uh, the y axis here is parts per trillion nanogram per liter. So primarily PFAS dominated up around 10 parts per billion. Again, liquid phase concentrations. Um, and then 5, 10, and 20% by weight fluorosorb doses that showed anywhere from 75 to 99.9% .9 removal. So really, really, really good data. When we look at it more on the logarithmic scale, uh, purposely, so now we're on orders of magnitude difference, just to show that there was slightly more or slightly less removal affinity of the short chain, which is not uncommon. That's one of the uh, characteristic limitations of adsorption-based technologies. If you look at most new novel adsorbents, typical of the bellwether is PFBA, the C4 carboxylic. Um, if it's adsorbing that, then you know that, that's a very good sign. And 86, 72, and 74 percent reductions when we're starting with concentrations that are at the PPB level is very good performance from a risk management source zone mitigation type strategy. And again, the perfluoroalkyl acids that are shown here are all post-top assays. So these have all been digested. Any precursors would have been incorporated into this. And only the data that we had detections for is shown if there were any detections. So for instance, this 99.8% reduction of the perfluorohexane sulfonate is a nine to tech measurement, but because it showed up in the control, it was carried through for the evaluations. The next step, uh, not, un not uh, dissimilar from what Chadi did in his study, was to look at geotechnical capabilities. Um, I'm a huge advocate and proponent of what he suggested of not using Portland cement with these mixes. However, uh, we were in a sensitive ecological uh, condition, and don't laugh, but we needed to be protective of tortoises finding their way into our pits and sinking in our pits. So we needed to have some degree of uh, of unconfined compressive strength returned to existing conditions, and we really couldn't allow for the soil to self-settle itself over time, even though this really was in the back 40. So we added a, a variety of concentrations of Portland cement. I'll explain why 10 and 15 were used with some of the alternative products, but Portland, um, Portland cement in the quantity of 5% became our control. So whereas Shadi had unamended controls, we, I used a Portland cement only as the control because the base case was that we needed to mix the pit up and at least regain some unconfined compressive strength. The geotechnical testing that was performed was pocket penetrometer at one in four days, which is basically a, a handheld push pin that you push in just to understand that you're getting some sort of compressive strength. But then we also did aggressive break tests at seven and 28 days and looked at hydraulic conductivity at 28 days. So the data, just setting up this plot, on the far axis we have unconfined compressive strength in pounds per square inch. On the near graph, we have hydraulic conductivity with higher hydraulic conductivity at the bottom, lower hydraulic conductivity at the top, just to try and confuse you, and then all the different uh, formulations that we tested. So the first thing to populate is this seven and 28 day unconfined compressive strength, and you'll see that the control, just 5% Portland, and the fluorosorb and its Portland performed appropriately enough. We didn't really have a firm target for UCS, we just needed it to not cave in and um, be able to support moderate load. However, the alternative that we used at 5% and 10%, um, they had a little bit more of an antagonistic development on strength development. That may or may not be important, but because we had to add more Portland, there was a corresponding reduction in hydraulic conductivity. So if you're gonna start looking at leaching of cores that have a confirmed difference in hydraulic conductivity, you've invoked a hydraulic phenomenon that artificially biases these to have a better leachate reduction potential. So we had to modify our 1315 method to incorporate that, and I'll explain why. I'll explain how in a, in, a, in, a, in a bit. The other thing that we did with those mixed cores that were Portland cement and the fixin was started to run the 1315 leaching analysis that Jody had talked through. So this plot presents nanogram per liter concentrations at the third leach. So this is a snapshot. You saw that Shadi's plots had geometric plots that showed all nine events of the leaching data. I'm a lowly consultant and don't have uh, minions of grad students to run my analytical samples for me, so I have to pay $350 per sample. So I had to do it on the cheap, and what we did was we assessed at the third day through some trials that that could be used as a representative time stamp over the, over the nine halls, and, and we are making a modification to that, and I'll explain that at the end. This is all post-top data. Again, any of the perfluoroalkyl acids that were detected at any time were shown. The bottom shows the, uh, or the x-axis shows the various 
uh, formulations that were run, and again, the concentration is a liquid concentration. So Shadi presented a mass per surface area leach. I don't have that because this is a time series snap. So I actually have one of those leachate baths that he showed, a set volume of water that had a certain amount of mass in it, and that's what this concentration represents. Populate the data, the 5% PC, much like what Shadi saw, didn't do very much. All the others, for the majority, were non-detect. This one uh, C10 carboxylic uh, was right around 13 parts per trillion. Could have been matrix interference, could have been an anomaly, could have been a precursor transformation. This is all post-top data, but certainly uh, was not present at the 10%, neither at the 5% or 10% of the alternative. So the data is what it is, but what, ke what we keep in mind is that this is still two, you know, close to two orders of magnitude reduction in leachate for a source zone management strategy. Um, the other thing that we looked at as part of that assessment to find out if the T3, the third leachate group, was the most appropriate for our snapshot analysis was to look at the last one to find out what happened. And not surprisingly, all of the assessments were non-detect. Now that should not be, right? That's, that, so that, that's, a, that's, a, that's an artificial bias. The control should still be giving off, um, uh, giving off uh, PFAS. However, Environmental, in situ environmental remediation wouldn't be a business since 1980 if slow advective uh, access to contamination wasn't a real problem. We created a concrete cylinder that had a permeability of about 10 to the minus four centimeters per second, leached it nine times over 63 days, and surprise, surprise, the concentrations went down. So every time we took the cylinder out and put it into a new bath, we had to permeate the same surface area to get at the access. So had we sat this core for three years and leached it again, I bet PFAS comes off of it. But it's a time-invoked bias. So we need to be very cognizant of that when we picked our time series stamp at three days to understand that nine, everything's gonna be non-detect, okay? So we picked three as a representative and there's something else that we're gonna add from, to try and close the mass balance that I'll talk about at the end of the presentation. So with that, we took this to the field and the field implementation was what you would expect, uh, a lot of dirt, a lot of mixing, a lot of cursing, a lot of yelling. Um, the five test pits were mixed in July of 2018. We did 10 by 10 by 10 pits. We ripped off the top five feet to accommodate for the fluff of the fixant that we were adding. Uh, we did mix over the water table. Water was right around eight feet, so we mixed about five to 15 feet below ground surface. Uh, there was enough moisture within the pit itself that we didn't need to add any extra moisture. Um, we pretty much added the reagent via super sacks and conventional, uh, conventional exca excavation equipment and then used an alol tool to grind it into the soil and mix it around. Um, we used the extra soil that we ripped off in the top five feet to kind of grade these back to be protective of the tortoise and any other sensitive ecological uh, receptor. We had challenging mixing. Anytime that you're gonna implement a, uh, an ISS, it's, it's very important to make sure that you do a process pass. Uh, process pass basically being that you just take an excavator arm and destroy the structure before you start adding in your fixin'. We did not do that. We tried to do it all in one step. So we're gonna be cognizant of that moving forward, um, but we did have some challenging mixing conditions. And it, it kind of played into uh, the differences in Portland cement that we had to add. We kind of knew going into this that our method 1315 was gonna be different than what a conventional 1315 method would be, which would just be advancing a DPT point, taking a core to a lab and leaching it sequentially nine times. So we knew we were gonna have a little bit of a different application and our, our mixing will be continuously evaluated during the monitoring period and I'll explain that now because we're getting into it. So conventional ISS work is built upon a construction quality control plan. You run a treatability study, you establish metrics to signify your quality construction assurance, you implement the mix to those specifications, and then you walk away. You typically do not time series measure a mixed monolith. First of all, you don't want to jeopardize the monolith. Secondly, you've already established the efficacy of the work, and there's really no reason to do it. In this instance, we purposely wanted to time series sample the mixed monolith to understand the permanence of the fixation. So as part of the experimental design, we have four or five upcoming post-mix monitoring events spaced basically by six months about. 
It'll be a little bit more difficult with uh, on-base access and all sorts of stuff like that, but ideally it was six months over the two and a half year period of performance. So in October of 2018, we collected our first one. We assigned the test pits a random 12 area grid and divided them into three depths. The five to, uh, I'm, I'm blanking. So three vertical depths, shallow, medium, and deep, and 12, uh, 12 grids on top so that we have enough to sample uniquely throughout. And if the mixing was homogenous, as we hope that it was, the sample should be very consistent throughout, and we're going to get a great statistical stat scatter plot when all this is done. And that's basically what we're trying to do. Some of the borings had lower strength, right? Whether that was the antagonistic effect of the fixin or whether it was poor mixing, we don't know. But we modified our leaching procedure and didn't do intact cores like Chadi did. Instead, in our treatability lab, when we received the soil samples, we ground them to a uniform, I think right around a 200 sieve type perspective, and then sent that to the lab for leaching. And that's permissible under the 1315 method, which has a, uh, an accommodation for almost like a minor bucket that you would pack your crushed material in and then sequentially leach that little bucket through each of the leaching steps. So that's the way that we went about it. It normalizes out the differences in hydraulic conductivity imposed by Portland cement, and it also uh, uniform, creates a uniform particle size distribution so that the solidification piece of this, of this does not interfere or invoke any potential bias into the leaching. We're not necessarily interested if the Portland cement had any sort of solidification reduction of leaching. We really want to focus on the chemical stabilization of these various fixins. So this is the piece de la resistance, the, the data from the field after six months, setting up the plot on the uh, y-axis again. This is the, the third timestamp of the 1315 assessment from the first monitoring event. The, uh, the concentration on the y-axis is in parts per thousand, uh, parts per trillion. Um, all the different formulations are shown along the x-axis, and we had three direct push points from each test pit. And the alternatives came back with non-detect so far. The controls, the control, which was just the 5% Portland, pretty consistent with what we saw during the initial assessment. And then the fluorosorb showed approximately uh, close to an order of magnitude reduction in the leachate which is appreciable from a management strategy. And what we expect to see is that throughout the course of this ongoing performance monitoring period, we're gonna oscillate back, before, back and forth between non-detect measurements and minor detections just due to the limitations of our mixing method. So when I see three DPT concentrations that, are, that have very low uh, variability, that to me indicates good mixing. When I see pretty uh, variable responses when we were supposed to have homogenized the entire pit, that could be a function of either poor mixing or inefficient uh, fixant distribution. So another thing that we're working on is collecting geochemical parameters, and, but we just need more data to run these statistical plots to make these assessments. We just don't have enough data yet. So this is very preliminary, but it is the first six months that this has been sitting out. It's withstood two tropical storm events that have rolled through. So there's been hydraulic load on the, the, uh, the, uh, the monoliths. They've been, they've, they're holding up in good tact, and uh, we're, we're hoping for more positive results to come. Some of the next steps, uh, there's going to be f uh, three or four more monitoring events, depending on schedule and access. Uh, the next one is scheduled for early summer. It was scheduled for early spring, and it got kicked due to on-site uh, activities. Um, this is what I wanted to talk about with respect to the second performance monitoring event and getting more, giving a, a, a closer look at the leachate. Um, we're going to try to close the mass balance, and by that I mean we're going to collect cores and analyze the PFAS in the soil of the mixed monoliths. So the fluorosorb process, ISS, all this stuff, there is no destruction of the PFAS. They're just retained into a solid form that can't get into liquid. So we theoretically should be able to quantify that from a mass perspective. Then we're going to run a composite leach sample where we collect all a subset of all nine leaches, and knowing the liquid that we've leached, we can come up with a mass that's leached off those cores. And then, when we're done leaching, we'll run the PFAS in soil post-leach. So this should be the total mass, and the sum of these should equal that. So we're trying to close the mass balance to make sure that we're getting everything that we are, are, are leaching off and uh, 
if you're trying to, sub we, we have aspirations of submitting this to peer-reviewed publications, and this is the type of information that we're going to need to do so. So it's not cheap. Um, at about $350 a pop for these samples, um, doing you know five test pits and a bunch of different leachates when you didn't plan on it makes for an interesting conversation with project managers. Um, the third and fourth performance monitor events will, will occur in six months, and uh, hopefully in succession, but with the schedule the way it's going, uh, typically we won't be able to do that. And of course, we're trying to submit this. Now, I didn't acknowledge anyone because if you don't like the content, I don't want you to be associated with me. <laughs> but no, I have a great deal of, uh, of gratitude to Matt Geary and John Allen for supporting me on this work and uh, finding a way to, to help us on a research budget be able to uh, pull this off. So be happy to answer any questions you might have. This is a softball. So just how big was that turtle? <laughs> what kind of ground pressure are we talking about? So somewhere between Donatello and Raphael. <laughs> No, they were big. They were big tor tortoises, man. They moved. Um, we had to, I, we delayed implementation a week because we didn't want to get in the way of their, their pattern. Because we had spa staked out the, the pits based off the uh, baseline characterization to try and maximize where we'd hit the most PFAS. Uh, Jeff, can you uh, just speak to the handling of the fluorosorb? Did the material dust at all when you were applying it? Or uh, how about, did you apply it via a super sac or some other method? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, almost like sugar cubes into coffee, right? So we had our, our pit, took the excavator arm with the super stack, dropped it in, let the, super, let the excavator arm shred up the packaging, pulled the packaging out. Um, we used uh, misters to kind of suppress some of the dust because it is a little bit more of a powderous material. Um, but you know, low wind, high humidity condition, we didn't really have a lot of it, but as a health and safety precaution. Pretty easy to mix in too. Um, the material was really uh, coarse grain sandy, so it's actually pretty difficult uh, to try and evenly distribute that through it, but it worked. All right, I've either put you to sleep or. <laughs> my sales guys never take me to the field, so this is my opportunity. Um, what about the, the, the mixing question and blending the material in? I'm curious as to uh, challenges or. or with, with the other materials, especially the, um, the hydroxide. The layered hydroxide has a high hydrophobicity, um, so it, it tends to stick to stuff and, and really uh, doesn't want to be in the water, right? So <laughs> not like PFAS. Um, comparative assessment of mixing didn't really notice a, a drastic difference to, it effect, to the effect that it was inhibitory in any way. Um, trying to think, nothing that stuck out uh, specifically. We were pretty able to using the alol tool get the stuff into the soil at least, in, you know, visually. What? Yeah, right. Um, the alol tool took care of, of most of that, but no noticeable differences. I'm, I'm just curious because Chatty had the same thing in, in his data that it, you would think that if you're adding the fluorosorb or adding bentonite, you would sacrifice strength, but you would get a decrease in permeability. So you kind of get a double whammy of more of the absorption as well as the decrease. But your data showed that you actually saw, compared to the Portland, a decrease in permeability. I believe the other research showed the same thing. I'm just curious. Um, if you have a reasoning for that, I would think that you would see a, a decrease Actually, in permeability. Let me bring that back up, because I don't know if we saw a decrease in permeability. We saw less, we saw greater permeability than the 
higher concentrations of Portland. So this is 10% and 15% Portland, but right around 10 to the four for 5% across the board. And I mean, fluorazorb is a, uh, the, the one that we particularly used was slightly more fine grained, which could be in a typical admixture that you could put in a pozzolanic mix to improve the cementitious nature of cement. Maybe you won't get the strength with the aggregate, but certainly from, uh, you know, lower, uh, what's the, uh, con consistent hydraulic conductivity uh, from with it and without, I, w I wouldn't expect a, a gross difference. Yes? Who's gonna get there first? <laughs> yeah, so uh, two questions actually. So uh, it's a double layer hydroxide can you uh, secure a, a commercial source? Very difficult, but there are commercial providers. So we, we were, so that, that's a very good question. We were fortunate that we were doing 10 by 10 test bits, okay? There are commercial providers of layer double hydroxide. I won't give their, their name or whatever, but it typically is gonna come into the United States. It's not gonna be produced here. And there's a current climate when we have to pay 25% uh, tariff. Um, <laughs> no comment. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> um, it's actually my, my first question, and my, then second question is, um, why you use 10% uh, Portland cement for your, or 15% for your other two alternatives? What's the rationale? There, there was a, an antagonistic strength development. So originally we did 5% across the board. And we couldn't get we couldn't get it to set up. It, it we couldn't even make it form into a cylinder to test it. It was just falling apart. So we had to go with five with ten percent on the five and fifteen percent on the ten. And then what do you see the swells of your test pit like for the for the alternatives? Uh, I I don't have a qualitative assessment for that. It's a lot but of swells. Probably. It it was less than five feet because we removed the top mm -hmm. five feet before we mixed and we didn't see any bulking outside of that five foot. So whatever we added with Florizorb and Portland, we were able to withstand within that five foot freeboard. So you mean less than 50% volume increase? Uh, yeah. That's a lot. It is. <laughs> We were less than the five foot depth because we used some of the five foot, so it was less than 50% because um, we used some of the soil that we had extracted to put back in and grade it, but we didn't compact it to any specification. But there's a picture that shows it. Is it the carp saw ground? The removal piles in the background? Yeah. So there's still, it's, it's less than 50%. I, don't, I just don't have a number to quantify it. But it, it goes, any geotechnical assessment, you're adding a volumetric binder or whatever, you're gonna have some swell. Yeah, Matt. So I understand uh, you said you, you had to go higher Portland cement on the two uh, alternatives so that you could get the compressive strength you needed. But does that also contribute contribute to the reduction in leaching due, due to just hydraulic conductivity, because you're gonna have lower hydraulic conductivity as you add more cement. Right, and that's why we ground the samples to avoid that hydraulic bias. It so had, had we kept an intact monolith that had a known lower permeability, you're right, considering that we're trying to get this to leach over time series, we would have invoked a, a, bi a positive bias in favor of lower leachability at that lower permeability. By grinding, we kind of normalized all of that, took that out of it, and it was the, the mean particle size di diameter that we specified and then packed into the little cup that we leached. Gotcha. Yes. Uh, yeah, I can, okay. Traffic jam. <laughs> Was uh, everything you mixed above the water table or were you at the water table? We straddled it. 
So okay. water was right around eight feet below ground surface, yeah. and we mixed from five to 15. So that's where you got your moisture. Yep. Do you think that affected the amount of compaction you're able to do afterwards? Because well, we, you were at that interface of the water table? Potentially, I mean, there could have been some, some clays that we hydrated and, and swelled, right? Uh, we, we didn't compact it to any uh, specified compaction. We just left it as it was with the, the solidifying agent for it to gain strength naturally. So you just smoothed it out, I guess, yep. or leveled it out. Exactly. And w we would expect that as this dries over time, it'll probably crack and subside, and, you know, at least in the, in the Vado zone. Because once we destroyed the structure, there was a bathtub effect of water kind of coming up higher than the ambient water level. Oh. It's actually, not so much a question, just thinking about the mass balance. So for your alternative, you actually add the 10 to 15% more stuff into your soil. So if you calculate gram, uh, mass like gram per uh, nanogram per, per gram, so like this level, you actually the the alternative your your actual contaminant probably is less. We are going to have to contam. We are going to have to correct mm -hmm. for the add the extra fixant. You're correct. But I'm I'm not so much interested in a mass concentration as I am as a total mass. Because with the added uh, reagent that we had to add, we displaced more spoil soils. So the, theoretically, the volume is consistent. One more question for you, Jeff. Um, you mentioned that this is the first field pilot scale, uh, field pilot scale field work that's been done. Uh, are you aware of any developing guidance on in situ treatment for PFAS contaminated soils? Do you see that the industry is developing in that direction? Any, anything that you can sort of prognosticate along those lines? Hmm. For soils, no. Uh, most people, like I said, have, have, or most, in most instances, source zone soil has not been the, the leading cause of action. Because these constituents are mobile and they're in groundwater, um, or drinking water, point of entry treatment systems have been the focus right now. And, and again, we're catching, right? We're on our heels. Um, I think as, as we start to develop and, and think through these, there are certainly in situ type soil treatment technologies. For instance, um, Geosyntec is doing some very good work with, I uh, forget what university they're working with, but they're, they're looking at an in situ smoldering technique, which is a thermal option that would basically use volumetric air pass through almost like the butt of a cigarette to try and destroy these thermally in situ. Um, host of limitations, but a lot of upside if they can get it to work. So we just need some time for the industry to kind of think through some viable remedies. But when you think about the only mechanisms available are absorption, separation, or destruction. Destruction is extremely expensive. I mean, it, it's not cheap to implement in situ smoldering or even ex situ thermal desorption. There are, there are contractors who have, have that technology as well. Thanks, guys. <laughs>